Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So I want to start up at the top. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I have thought pretty much as long as I've been a Christian, which is uh, 23 years now, it, it just seems to me that if we are going to teach, if we are going to preach, that the best thing we can possibly teach and preach is what Jesus taught and what he preached. And so I've kind of searched this, the, the Gospels in particular to try and figure out what Jesus preached. Now, we know a lot of what he preached because we've got the Sermon on the Mount, we've got the, the, we've got the Sermon by the Sea, we've got these various sermons, but, but what Jesus is preaching is the Gospel of the Kingdom. And it, it, it reminds me of, of uh, Mark 1.15, which says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. I mean, that's the to me, that's the foundational message. Repeat, re repent and believe the gospel. The, go the word gospel, of course, meaning good news. The good news, of course, being that the Christ, the propitiation for our sins, the one who is going to enable us to be reconciled to God, has come into the world, has ushered in the gospel of grace, and now we can know, we can understand exactly how it is that we are reconciled to God. And that's, that's the basic message. And, and as I read through, uh, like we just read through the Sermon on the Mount, I really do see that everything that Jesus is saying is simply encouraging people to repent, encouraging people to change their old way of thinking, which is, you know, God is some check boxes, God is some laws, God is the law of Moses, and if I can just do this and do this and do this, I'm okay. And, and, to, and to completely repent of that, and to really try to, try to start understanding what it means to have a right relationship with God, and a right relationship with our neighbors. I mean, he said, you know, the two great commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and to love one another as yourselves, love your neighbors as yourselves. And it's really, and it, to me it really is that simple and and it makes me, I don't even know the right word, makes me uncomfortable when I, when I see a preacher or hear a preacher who gets way, way off of that because, you know, the logical end is, is what we see in a lot of churches, which is motivational speeches and, you know. <laughs> is, you know, we get off into tickling the ears, we get off into all these stories, we get off into the jokes, we get off into the entertainment aspect, and we get away from the fundamental message, which is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. I just want to touch on it again. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's a little sad to me how hung up people get on, on doctrines and this whole idea of the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven is one of those that if you Google it, you'll see that, that people get extremely 
adamant. 25 different categories. Oh, well, there's kind of two. That's either they're one and the same, or they're two completely different things. And Jesus himself, over in uh, uh, Matthew 19, let's see. Yeah, 1923, Jesus himself says, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I think Jesus is using those terms interchangeably. And, and I don't even really think it matters. You know, we want to be people who are in the kingdom of God. We want to be people who are in the kingdom of heaven. Those who argue the other way say, no, 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 heaven, the kingdom of heaven is just simply that, that, that mansion, that place that God has prepared for saints to go to, and that's all it amounts to. The kingdom of God is everything, because God has jurisdiction and authority over everything. And it's kind of like millennialist and premillennialist and post-millennialist. Post if you believe the wrong thing, you're going to go to hell. I mean, they get that serious about it. Um, I think if we look, and we're not going to this morning, but you know, over in Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in you. And I think when we put the passages together, what we understand is that if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you enter the kingdom at that point where you are born again, and you repent, and you have a living relationship with the living God. At that point, you've entered the kingdom, and it's eternal, and it's wherever you are, God is, and He's in control of it. And the other thing to note is that the phrase kingdom of heaven is only found in the book of Matthew. It's not found in any of the other Gospels. And in fact, in places where where the other Gospels are quoting Jesus in the same parable or the same passage, they'll use the kingdom of God where Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven. So, and here he says, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It, we should understand what that kingdom is. Either it's God's kingdom or it's a kingdom of our own making, some other kingdom, not God's kingdom. And so we need to be preaching people the good news of the kingdom of God. We can all enter the kingdom of God. I think what's very telling, well, we're going to get to it here when he sends out his 12 disciples, but he says, especially over in Luke, he says, he says, when you enter a city, tell the people, the kingdom of God is near you. And if they don't receive you when you leave, say, but know this, that the kingdom of God has come close to you. And I think that clearly means you had an opportunity to repent. You had an opportunity to hear and believe the gospel and repent and enter the kingdom. And you either chose to do so or you chose not to do so. Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And we know because Jesus says that those miracles are there that we might believe. They're there to underscore Jesus' deity and in one place he even says, if you don't believe my words, at least believe the miracles that nobody else did. But when he saw the multitudes, this is hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people who are flocking to him. So when you see the multitudes, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Well, that's interesting to me. The shepherd, the great shepherd, the true shepherd is right there. People are flocking to him by hundreds and thousands, and he's looking at them, and he says, they're weary and lost and have no shepherd. What that, to me, that paints a very poignant picture. All these people are coming because they want to be healed. They want to be fed. They want to see this person that everybody's talking about. It would be neat to see a miracle. They're not there because they see the Son of God. They're not there because they see an opportunity to repent and enter the kingdom. They're lost. These people are flocking to Jesus and they're lost. And Jesus sees this. 
like sheep having no shepherd, scattered, weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I think one of the reasons this passage is so poignant for me, because I don't think anything has changed in 2,000 years. We see people flocking to churches, flocking to churches um, because they have a need. And oftentimes they don't realize that, what, that, that they have a spiritual need. They have a need to repent. They have a need to, to submit completely to God and let Him direct their paths. They, maybe they have a need to be healed. Maybe they have a need for their finances. Maybe they, maybe they need a good motivational talking to. But I saw a, a statistic, I've seen it a couple times now recently, and, and when the pew, for example, when pew goes out now and they, and, they, and they do their surveys, people who go to church today, I'm talking about just across the board in, in America, say the number one thing that they're looking for is a good band. They're looking for the best music. They want, they want, you know, they want a, they want a, uh, a good-looking singer who just, who just has this magnificent voice. They want the music to sound just like it's coming off of the CD, and they want them to know all the latest songs from, that you hear on K-Love, or Spirit, or anything, and, and that's the number one thing they're looking for. The second thing, go ahead. Four years ago was clean bathroom. Now it's music, nursery, restrooms. That's what they're looking for in a church. So I don't see where much has changed. And so I don't, I don't think anything has changed. And, and what it means is that when we're praying for workers under the harvest, I think what we're saying is equip us. Equip us to do the work of the kingdom. Equip us to, to share the gospel of the kingdom. Equip us to be able to communicate that love of Jesus and that, and that, and that need for repentance. One of the things that, and, and I don't, this is not about me, but it's very interesting in, in the jails. I, I go usually go now with a fellow named Edgar who, who, who did 14 years in, in a penitentiary. Um, Someone with some experience to go with. Somebody you. with some experience. And, 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 and the wonderful thing about Caldwell is they'll, they'll, they'll let us in whenever we get there. So we're usually, we're usually in there and prayed in and, and we're usually um, in the Word by by 7.30 and they don't kick us out until 10.30 so we have three hours and 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 I think Edgar and I are a good a really good team because he's not afraid to really get in these guys faces and talk to them about why they're there and how they got there and how they're going to keep coming back if they don't if they don't surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ on the other hand, you know, I know the Bible really well, and so anything that Edgar says or that anybody else says, I can say, here's where that is in the Bible. Why don't we go see exactly what the Word of God says about that? And so, and so when the guys get to know us, what they tell me oftentimes is what they love about Edgar is he's been where we are, he has experienced what we're experiencing, and he can, he can relate that to what we're reading. What we love about you is the enthusiasm and the joy that we see in you whenever you talk about the gospel. They said, you just glow, you just light up, and we want that. And so, I think when we're praying to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, to me, what we're praying is that God would equip us, would give us the tools, would give us the understanding, would fill us with the Spirit so that it's not me doing the talking, but it's the Spirit of God doing the talking so that what comes out is words of life 
and words of truth that people who have been prepared, the soil that's been prepared by God, will hear that and receive that and God will be able to give an increase. Matthew chapter 10. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, you know how much I enjoy comparing verses in the Bible. If we read about the twelve, the ladies are in here this morning. As we read about the twelve, we see that in other accounts, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, is also known as Judas, as Judas. Judas, the one who did not betray Christ, as opposed to Judas Iscariot. And what we find is it's really not uncommon for people to have multiple names 2,000 years ago. And although, although the Bible here uses the phrase surname, um, what, what the Bible means is that he's also called Thaddeus. Surnames as we think of them, last names, the first last name known dates from the 10th century is when people have actually first started appending family names. So you could tell one John from the next John from the next John from the next John. And it wasn't until the 16th century that last names were, were the norm. Um, and that's why you see in the Bible oftentimes you'll see so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. That's how they would distinguish. Well, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't John the son of Bill. This is John the son of Richard. Um, or they would name the place they were from. They would, they would, they would name the town that the person was from again to distinguish them. Um, so it's so we shouldn't we shouldn't be surprised that Alphaeus also I'm mean, sorry Labaius also known as Thaddeus is also known as Judas. These twelve. Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. We might wonder for a minute, why Jesus was so specific about only going into the cities of the Gentile, the way of the uh, the cities of the uh, lost, or the communities of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And at that time, the Middle East is, or what we know as the Holy Land, is really is divided up into cities and communities that are ethnic. You have a Hellenistic, Hellenist cities scattered all around, what we might call Greek cities. Actually, they're a mixture of Gentiles. You have Samaritan cities scattered around, and you have Jewish cities scattered around. And Jesus is specifically saying, go to those cities, go to those towns, go to those communities that are Jewish. And people segregated themselves. and. And they really, they still do to some extent, probably not as much as they did a century ago. But you think about, I'm thinking about, say, Europe in the, in the early 20th century. We get the word ghetto from those communities that were kind of exclusively Jewish or exclusively African European or exclusively foreigners. Even to this day, we talk about, you know, San Francisco having a Chinatown, and Houston has a Chinatown. 
we have these communities where people naturally gather together with others who speak the language they understand and who kind of think like them and have the same kind of culture and maybe religious beliefs they have. No different 2,000 years ago, and Jesus is saying, go specifically to those communities that are Jewish. And we might wonder why that e is when the Bible talks about the message being to all peoples. Even, even in the Old Testament, in a number of locations, it talks about the message being for all peoples and being for the Gentiles, and the Gentiles being the ones who are going to flock to the light. And, and many, many references. And Jesus talks about, about the message uh, being not just for the, the Jews, but for the Gentiles. But I think the explanation is pretty simple. I'm going to flip over real quick to Romans the ninth chapter, Romans 9, let's see, uh, we'll start in verse 9, 9 3, we'll start in verse 9, 9 verse 1, this is Paul speaking, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. So, clearly what he's saying here, and I think it's really evident if you read the whole Bible, but what Paul is saying is in a nutshell is that God chose a people and he said, I'm going to reveal myself to the world through this people. I'm going to, this is the people that is going to be the purveyors of the law, the purveyors of the covenants, the purveyors of the words of the prophets. And, and think about it, if God had sent um, Elijah to Syria, and had sent David to Damascus, and had sent Isaiah to Egypt, and had sent uh, Jeremiah to Babylon. I mean, if he'd scattered, scattered the purveyors of his word, around the world because of how we are, I don't believe that we would have put those all together and understood that they're all coming from the same God and it's the same message and we would have put it, had it in one language that could then be written down and, and collated and could become the Old Testament and then ultimately become the Bible that we have. So God in His infinite wisdom chose a people, a relatively minor people and all of his covenants, all of his law, all of his prophecies, all of the things that he wanted to share with us, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the message of the gospel were introduced to the whole world through the Jews. And so he told them, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And I find it telling that he doesn't say, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God has been here all along. Or, or you know, repent for one of these days you're going to die and you're going to want to enter the kingdom. Or the kingdom will be upon us at the end of the ages. He doesn't say that. He says the kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God is upon you. It is at hand. And I personally... What I, what I believe is that, is that we are in that period of time, in that epoch, in that, in that season, um, in that last time when the kingdom of God has been brought to us by the life and the atoning death of Jesus Christ. And we can enter the kingdom simply by repenting by being born again, by allowing God to fill us with His Spirit, and by being led by that Spirit. It's not something we have to die, have to, you know, die in order to partake of. 
and I and I see that clearly written in in, in many passages here. We're going to wrap it up there. Who has something to add to that? 